All right, so the last lecture was about the time domain imaging, time domain extrapolation, time domain imaging. Uh, kind of works well as a, as a separate lecture um, because the, um, it's only lab nine where you, have, you, you would have to grapple with time domain imaging and the, and the code that I wrote for it uh, that Claire Bout wrote and I, I translated. And uh, you're, you're probably not going to uh, get to uh, lab nine. So uh, we're, in, we're in good shape. Uh, uh, the, uh, the next topic, side boundary conditions, which is now three pages into um, notes number 27, uh, since the time domain imaging overlapped into, into, page, into notes number 27 a bit. Uh, the side boundary conditions, uh, that does uh, impact the work you'll do with lab eight. Uh, which is one of the more important ones that, that I want you to get to. So it's a uh, uh, pretty good uh, sequencing here uh, to be starting side boundary conditions now. Um, so, you know, our, our data, our, uh, our zero offset surveys, our stack sections, our, uh, our migrated sections, our models, our whole calculation has edges in X. Okay, uh, we don't have, uh, at least yet, any surveys, uh, uh, reflection surveys that, you know, go all the way around the Earth and and thus uh, don't um, don't have any edge laterally. Okay, there's a you know there's an area beyond which we. Didn't have the money to record, didn't have the interest to record, didn't have permission to record. And so, um, you know, we, uh, there's no data uh, in, our, in our data set beyond uh, whatever edge we have, whatever edges we have. Um, and so what do we do? I mean, uh, we don't have any data, and that means that when our calculations reach into that area, right, um, what happens? Well, it's assumed that the, that we do have data, and that the values, the amplitudes, the seismic reflections are zero. Okay, and that is a really bad assumption. And I'll I'll this this little um, explanation of side boundary conditions is is going to uh, explain that. Um, but but you know what else can we do? Right beyond where we have recorded data. Um, what else can we do other than assume that it's uh, um, that it's that it's zero? I mean, there may be some geologic situations where uh, we could even assume that the geology is periodic, right? And if we got if we get one principal fold, then we could uh, we could go further. Um, and that, in fact, is uh, is one one thing that's very useful about the uh, about working in the Fourier domain is, is that you are working on, on one principal fold of omega. And you don't have to worry about the edges of your, of your data in omega. You have all the omegas that there are to, to worry about. Um, and of course, you, you inverse transform, and, uh, and, and you, you can go beyond the edges of your data by assuming that the, uh, that the situation, the geology, the data are, are periodic in x. Okay, uh, that's you know obviously not an assumption that's going to work very well in 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 ninety nine point nine nine percent of the places right that we have to worry about. So we have this zero data that's really there according to our calculation beyond the edges of our surveys. Okay, you know maybe we got to a property line, maybe we got to the to the shoreline, um, maybe we got to the um, uh, maybe we got to uh, uh, the end of our of our funding. Um, there's always edges. Okay, so uh, you know any any wave. Okay, and and here you know I'm I'm representing a uh, downgoing wave, but an upgoing wave will do the same thing. If it's uh, if it's propagating, you know, against the edge and impinging on the edge, right? So here's a wave front that's propagating down and a bit to the right. And as it as it's dragging along this edge, it's producing a reflection. Okay, 
So this is an incident wave, and here is a reflected wave. And it's not reflected off any real geological structure. It's reflected off the edge of our calculation, the edge of our data set. Uh, and there's going to be there. There always is some, you know, non-zero reflection coefficient. Okay. Uh, so so let's see let's see why that happens. Okay, with something as simple as zero data, right? Why do we get a why do we get a reflection? Okay, let's take our uh, our Fourier mode. All right, so you know we can we can do a lot of things with these with these Fourier modes, right? So this. This wave is going to be represented as a monochromatic wave. It's it's it'll have a slope, it'll have a frequency, right? It's got a frequency, and the slope is de determined by the ratio of kx and kz, right? That's k sub x times x, k sub z times z, and omega times t. And uh, uh, so here's a simple Fourier mode, you know, one uh, x direction wave number, one z direction wave number, and and one frequency omega. And so the uh, um, you know we if we reflect that off the right hand side right then it's reflecting in x okay and so the reflection is you know the reflection coefficient times p r is the reflection coefficient you know which is some scalar uh, some real scalar um, could be positive could be negative. Uh, but it has to be less than less than one, all right, um, to be physical anyway. And 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 notice what we have here uh, in the in the imaginary exponential. We've got instead of positive kx, we have minus kx times x. Uh, now notice this reflected wave is still moving down, so we're not reversing the sign of kz, okay, uh, and uh, we're not reduce we're not. Uh, you know this wave is still exploding; it's it's expanding with time. So uh, we're not changing the sign on omega. Okay, but the reflection has, uh, you know, whatever its kx was after reflecting from this boundary, it'll be this side boundary. It'll have the negative of that same kx. Okay. So so we're going to use this to explore the uh, you know to figure out what that. What that uh, boundary condition is, okay, and uh, so so here's the uh, here's the deal. What's what's happening? You know, at at the at the boundary itself on this blue vertical line at the boundary of the calculation, the edge of the data set. You know, the the wave the wave uh, amplitude is zero. Okay, we have no no other assumption we can make. The wave amplitude is zero. Okay, so that means at the boundary, okay, and and at the boundary, the wave equation is going to be this boundary condition operator. Okay, um, you take the uh, the incident wave and you you add the reflection coefficient times the the you know the the direction of the uh, reflected wave, right? And that is equal to zero because at the boundary, all we get is all we have is zero. There's no wave. Okay, and that's what uh, we know that the waves in our original field area, you know, were actually out there. Okay, but we didn't record them. You know, we didn't we didn't uh, uh, you know mash down the fence and go on you know go onto private land and and put a sensor out there. Uh, and so the, the non-recording is a recording of zero. Okay. Um, all right. So then this uh, uh, you know this shows you that this is a still the, the boundary condition operator B is still linear, so you can distribute it in like this, and um, uh, <coughs> uh, and and uh, we'll 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 put the boundary condition operator at some points into. Um, uh, the kx and omega domain instead of in the x and t domain. So the, there we'll call it d um, for reasons that aren't very clear to me, but that's what Clairbout does. All right. So so since b is linear, okay, um, that means that that then we can solve this for r, right? You, you know the the uh, the scalar r will come right through the uh, the boundary condition operator because it's linear. So r is equal to minus the boundary condition operator uh, times you know operating on the incident wave and divided by the boundary condition operator operating on the reflected wave. 
Now, whatever, however complicated those waves are, and however complicated that boundary condition operator is, the incident and reflected wave differ only in the sign of kx right there. That's the only difference. Otherwise, they're the same. Okay, and especially you can see that for the for this Fourier mode, right? So um, the uh, basically we have the same boundary condition operator. And uh, we could express it with in terms of kx and omega, uh, and and d is the same thing, and the reflection coefficient is minus the boundary condition operator for kx and omega, uh, divided by the ratio with the boundary condition operator for the same kx but negated, and the same omega. All right, so um, uh, that's how we can figure eventually the. Uh, um, the uh, uh, the reflection coefficient. All right. So now let's uh, uh, let's talk about some different boundary condition operators. All right. So the first one is this simple situation where we have a zero boundary. Okay. The wave field Q is zero on the boundary and of course outside the boundary. Okay. And and you know these conditions are explicitly inherent in the tridiagonal system. Right, so we're solving for the next z level, you know, in evolving our wave field, and here's the uh, the z level above, and uh, you know, implicitly there's a zero sitting out here, you know, beyond our 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 survey, which gets multiplied by the alpha that isn't there, right, and so that's uh, you know that's an implicit zero. Um, so. Uh, uh, Remember the definition of the boundary condition operator, right? The boundary condition operator applied to the wave value is equal to zero. Okay, so if I start with zero and I want the uh, right, I, the Q is zero, and I want and I apply the boundary condition operator uh, to the um, I apply the boundary condition operator to to the to the zero wave, and I get zero. Okay, then the simplest boundary condition operator that I that I could infer from that. Is that the boundary condition operator is the identity operator, just passes the zero right through. Okay, if there was something else there, it would pass that through. But uh, all right, so we now we've defined the boundary condition operator to be the identity operator. All right, and so the reflection coefficient is basically minus identity over identity. And and here just you know showing you uh, uh, in a little more detail um, that really that's minus d uh, of uh, Kx and omega over d of minus kx and omega, and so um, you know the magnitude of uh, of here. Uh, you know you, you expand this in terms of, of the uh, the mode, right? And what you've got left is uh, minus i times two kx uh, k sub x times x, right? Uh, and the the magnitude of that, of course, is one, and um, and then you have uh, minus one, so. The uh, uh, and maybe it's even simpler here. You know, it's just uh, minus identity uh, uh, over identity, right? And um, uh, so the you know you have zero data, right? Zero boundary, and the reflection coefficient turns out to be minus one. This is a this is a disaster, right? Minus one is a perfect mirror. It's a perfect reflection coefficient. Yeah, it's flipping the sign. But uh, of the incident wave to get the reflected wave, but that means that the reflected wave is just as strong as the as the incident wave. That's terrible. Okay, so our 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 solutions are going to be shot through, you know, uh, and here in this downgoing wave uh, uh, view, um, you know, it's going to be shot through with a uh, uh, with these false side reflection waves. Okay. Now, if you if you you know if I reverse each of these arrows uh, and and think about an upgoing wave, it's the same problem. Okay, maybe this is the upgoing. This is an upgoing wave, right? And this would be the reflected uh, uh, wave, which is also upgoing. Uh, so for every um, every uh, dipping reflector that impinges on the side boundary, you get this uh, uh, just as strong reflected ref reflector. Okay, so the so we're going to reflect the the dips of the reflectors around the around the boundary. It's it's you know it's going to be very structurally confusing. 
Okay, so it, this is terrible, you know, and that's what we're going to get. Um, and uh, you'll see that in, in Lab 8, uh, which also uses downgoing waves. Um, and you can see it in, uh, in Lab uh, 9, uh, uh, although we're not going to do that. Um, uh, you would see it uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the migration as well. All right, so, so uh, you know, the zero boundary operator is, is, is awful. It's 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 terrible, you know. We we we're stuck with these with these side boundaries. Uh, can we mitigate them in any way? All right. Uh, well, let's try. You know, what if we what if the wave field has zero slope at the boundary? Okay, which means dq dx is zero on the boundary. Okay. Uh, we can alter the uh, top and bottom rows of the tridiagonal matrix to uh, to account for that. Um, you know, we have. Uh, you know, if if here we 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 put zero in the the existing D, and and Q zero at the next level and Q n at the next level, we want Q zero to equal Q one. We want Q n to be equal to Q n minus one, right? So the top and bottom, you know, here's the regular members of the tridiagonal matrix. So at the top and bottom, we could put in one and minus one. Okay, both both there. I mean, that's this is on the left side. This is on the right side. Okay, at the bottom. So that would, uh, and then you know the d values have got to be uh, changed to zero as well. Uh, so actually, the the easiest way to implement this is is by uh, expanding the whole system to add a, a, a false boundary layer, right, a boundary column on each side. Okay, so the uh, uh, in this case, right, uh, we want we want to apply the boundary operator to the wave and um, and and we want to get zero, right? So um, the um, the boundary operator is the x derivative operator, uh, and then d that means I, I wrote b first, uh, but wanting to wanting to put it into uh, the kx domain, d is ikx, right? Because ikx is the Fourier dual of of x direction uh, uh, of the x direction derivative. Okay, so um, the we now we know what the boundary operator is. Okay, and so um, uh, the reflection coefficient is minus uh, b or or d of i k x over b or d of minus i k x, which means uh, uh, right the derivative uh, is is just uh, minus i k x over minus i k x is positive one. It's no better. Um, you know, it's still a, you know we get a hundred percent of the ampl of the incident amplitude in the reflection. Okay, uh, that's certainly no better than having minus a hundred percent. So the zero slope boundary is is just as bad. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to show you now is Clayton and Enquist's um, uh, you know at this point rather famous um, and uh, very useful, very widely implemented. Um, so-called absorbing boundaries. Okay, um, these uh, these will turn out to be quite simple to implement. They're they're fairly effective. Uh, they're not really effective enough for uh, earthquake modeling, although you know the codes that that I use for earthquake modeling still have Clayton and Enquist options. Um, they're not. Um, uh, you you still get. Uh, um, you know, false uh, uh, these false reflections from the boundaries. Um, the The whole idea here is that we uh, is that we go for you know any improvement over one hundred percent reflection coefficient at the side boundary is is good. Okay, and and you know with Clayton Enquist we can get down to ten percent. All right, so it's not great. It's not real accuracy. Uh, it's you know we still see those false boundary reflections. Um, but you know, at ten percent uh, uh, instead of one hundred percent, it's it's quite useful. You know, at least you can uh, generally scale or use a color color table in your in your uh, in your uh, reflection sections that that won't let the client see uh, the uh, the side boundary reflections very obviously. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's that's one thing you can do. Okay, so uh, uh, at the um, 
at the, and we're going to talk about the boundary that's at uh, at at positive x. You know, the right hand boundary. Okay, just to you know, we, we can do a, a mirror image analysis for the uh, uh, for the left side boundary. Okay, the boundary that is x is at x equals zero. All right. So at the right hand boundary, we we would like to have a a wave. That moves only in positive kx. It moves only in the positive x direction, with no negative kx. Okay, so uh, here's a um, here's a scale dispersion relation, right? Uh, this is uh, uh, kx kz space, except both kx and kz are divided by omega and multiplied by the velocity. So you know, we've been using a, a, a semicircular dispersion relation, which is for upgoing waves, so uh, kz is negative, and then scaling it by uh, uh, v over omega makes the um, um, makes the makes the uh, the circle have a radius of one. Okay, so the circle has a radius of one. So this is for a downgoing. Uh, I'm sorry, for upgoing waves. Okay. So in the interior, right, we have our normal, you know, finite difference solutions, our normal uh, paraxial wave equations, okay, in the interior, and uh, and at the edge, we're gonna we're gonna make we're gonna chop up this uh, dispersion relation. We're gonna create an entirely new and very unphysical um, wave equation. That's only going to allow waves to propagate out of the grid to the right. Okay, and and we're going to chop this. Uh, uh, we're going to do that by chopping this this uh, semicircle into a quarter circle. So we're going to just eliminate this part here that's dashed. Right, that's the part that allows waves to propagate up and to the left. Right, we're not going to allow that. We're going to we're going to take the we're going to take this quarter circle. And we're going to allow waves to propagate up and only to the right on the boundary. So, so this is, in a, in a sense, this is a real computational kludge. You know, we're changing the rules, we're changing the wave equation right at the boundary to get what we want. All right, and it, you know, so it's kind of incredible that that Clayton and Enquist could make this work at all. You know, because it's so it's so non-physical. You know. Um, I mean, it's not physical already that we're only using upgoing waves, and now we're going to, you know, at this narrow strip on the right-hand side of our calculation area, we're going to use use a wave equation that only allows upgoing and right-going waves. Okay, just trying to keep that reflection from coming back, you know, toward the left, because of course, within the main calculation area, you know, we've got to we've got to maintain our whole semicircle, you know, or we'll only get dips to the uh, to the left or something like that. Uh, okay, so um, um, you know we we would like to have this uh, pure quarter circle, all right. But already we know that we can't, you know, we can't make a finite difference. Uh, we can't make a, a wave equation out of that, especially not in the in the, especially not in the um, uh, in the physical domain. Okay. So um, uh, the first attempt, right? We we always start simple. Just, let's just try this, right? Uh, and and this is what you know Clayton and Enquist published a paper on. Okay, the first attempt, we're going to approximate this black semicircle with this red dashed line. Okay. Now, what's the equation of that red dashed line? Okay, the equation of the red dashed line is um, where is it? Um, is uh, 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 v k x over omega is equal to c? Yeah, there it is. V k x over omega is equal to c. Okay, that is going to be our boundary condition wave equation, which is also our boundary condition operator. Okay, uh, it'll become clear in a moment why we need to make such a simple equation. Here it is, right here. Okay. Right, if we make it equal to zero, right, our boundary condition operator has to be equal to zero. So v k x over omega minus c is equal to zero. That's our that's our wave equation. Okay, and we'll see, you know, we'll see uh, in a sec why 
uh, why this is a pretty easy one for us to use. Um, and you can see it is, it is a very crude approximation. It only matches the semicircle right, I mean, the quarter circle right here, okay? which is, you know, depending on the value we set for c, okay, that's going to, um, uh, that's going to imply an angle of propagation theta 1. Okay. Uh, and and it, is, it is actually that point where, where our, approximated, our approximation to the, semi, to the quarter circle actually matches the quarter circle. That's the point where we'll get the most cancellation. We'll have the least reflection coefficient for waves at this angle theta 1. So actually, uh, although this is not done uh, for some reason, um, we could change c. You know, if we if we thought up against our right hand boundary, you know, we would have mostly wave mostly dips of uh, of uh, you know some like fifty degrees impinging on the right hand boundary. Then for migration against the right hand boundary, we can set this c to be appropriate for. Um, uh, for 15 degrees, what would that be? Uh, well, for 30 degrees, uh, C would be one half, right? So uh, you know, for 15 degrees, C is going to be, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, point, uh, uh, point one five or something. So uh, 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 C becomes our tunable parameter, right? And, and of course, you know, the equation also depends on the velocity. Um, so we got to get that right too, at least as far as we can. Okay. So uh, here, uh, you know, here's here's a dispersion relation, right? This is a dispersion relation. So we can take this to the physical domain using the tricks that we've used already, and and then we can find a difference in. Okay. So uh, you know, kx is uh, you know is a horizontal derivative, right? And omega is a is a time derivative, right? Uh, the, the, they're Fourier they're duals, so we we can multiply uh, the equation, all the terms of the equation by omega. So we have v k x minus omega c is equal to zero. Uh, we factor out i k x, right? Um, what did I do here? I think I multiplied uh, uh, all terms by i um, by i. Is that what I did? Yeah. So there's uh, yeah, just multiplied all terms by i, so we have v times i k x, which becomes v times d q d x, and then we have plus c times uh, minus i omega, and and that becomes c times d q d t, right? Because the Fourier dual of d q d t is minus i omega. So so here is this weird, you know, I mean it's not a very good approximation, but it's a weird. Uh, approximation to the quarter circle um, wave equation. Okay, so this should allow uh, propagation only to the right. Uh, and so this is now the boundary condition operator, right? We have the boundary condition operator operating on Q gives zero, right? And so the boundary condition operator is V uh, ddx plus C ddt operating on Q gives uh, gives zero. Uh, now, uh, what's the uh, so what's the reflection coefficient we're going to get out? Okay, so remember the reflection coefficient is minus the boundary operator applied to kx and omega, and then uh, over the boundary operator applied to minus kx and omega, um, and then uh, this is a negative sign out in front of this fraction here, which should all be written up higher here, you know, right after this equal sign, but uh, that's uh, uh, a little tricky there. Um, so we have v of kx over omega minus c uh, minus, uh, divided by minus v kx over omega minus c, and so we have v kx over omega minus c divided by v kx over omega plus c. Okay, and then uh, recalling that uh, you know we'd like to we'd like to represent uh, our reflection coefficient in terms of uh, theta one, right? Because uh, you know we want to know what dips, what waves are going to get canceled, and which won't be canceled. Okay, so uh, uh, the uh, v k x over omega is the sine of uh, theta, okay, and um, because that's velocity times uh, times slowness, 
uh, right? Kx over omega is also the slowness p, the uh, the ray parameter p, um, and so the the reflection coefficient, you know, coming from here, right, is sine theta minus c divided by sine theta plus c, and so just let's put in some uh, uh, some values and see what it is. At zero dip, the reflection coefficient is minus one. That's no improvement. At forty five degrees dip. The reflection coefficient is uh, 1 minus square root of 2 times c uh, over 1 plus square root of 2 times c. So actually, uh, you know, uh, we could um, we could we could you know adjust c to make that fairly small. Okay. Now uh, when when theta is equal to theta 1, you know, this determines c. That that means that v k x over omega is equal to c. And then the reflection coefficient is c minus c over c plus c, which is zero. All right. So it's gonna, the, and you can plot this in Excel if you like using some value of c, uh, and you'll find that at theta one, okay, uh, it reaches zero, and it starts at uh, you know zero at one, and reaches the minimum at theta one, and then goes up from there. So you know, over this range, we're getting some pretty good cancellation of um, uh, pretty good cancellation of um, uh, of our reflections, our side boundary reflections. D do we have to worry much about about that one? Uh, you know, at zero dip, zero propagation angle, the wave really isn't impinging on the boundary. So. The fact that we have a, a, a reflection coefficient of one isn't isn't a big deal, okay? So for c equal to sine theta one, right? We can design in a zero reflection coefficient. So you know, up against the boundary, you you think you know for whatever reason, previous experience, geology, looking at the data, you know, you've got um, um, you've got uh, uh, dips of uh, of theta one. Then you design your C, and uh, and you'll get the least reflections possible. Okay, so um, uh, now here's here's the reference to uh, the Clayton and Enquist uh, paper on uh, on their absorbing you know this this kind of absorbing boundary condition these you know this fractured quarter circle wave equation right for um, wave equation migration. There's another paper I think it's also in geophysics. Uh, where they applied the same principles to um, to get absorbing boundary conditions for um, uh, wave equa wave equation modeling, okay, um, and that's that's the one that uh, well they're both still used. So uh, you know they got two papers out of this one idea uh, because they had two different applications, you know, migration and modeling, uh, you know, like uh, like earthquake uh, uh, wave propagation modeling. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's figure out how to how to you know put this how to insert this bizarre quarter circle approximated wave equation into our uh, into our calculation. Okay, so as an example, let's take the uh, implicit finite difference calculation for downgoing wave extrapolation in the frequency domain. That's what's in uh, you know I refer to it as extrap.c and and uh, and it's extrap.java, which is the uh, um, the uh, uh, the program that you're given. Um, I could give you all the C codes if you really want them. The uh, uh, the advantage of the Java code is that it's linked to a way to display the waves. You don't have to if you use the C codes, you got to display the wave. You got to display the the calculations uh, uh, yourself, uh, which you know with with um, uh, MATLAB is not a not a great deal of trouble, but it's uh, even easier in uh, uh, in the Java codes. So that's based on a Clairbout program written in uh, RAT4, which is a uh, like condensed version of Fortran. Um, and first I translated it into C, and then later I translated it all into Java uh, for for the most portability. Um, the thing that you'll notice, uh, you know, working with these codes is that uh, the um, the RAT4 version might be five lines, the C version is twenty lines, and the Java version is eighty lines. Okay, uh, uh, 
that just seems to be the way it is. Maybe it's my programming style. OK, so for the, uh, for the diffraction calculation, we're going to use the 15 degree retarded wave equation. Right, so we have dq. I'm, I'm sorry, d squared q dz dt is equal to v over two times d squared q dx squared, and we put in the frequency domain. So uh, uh, we replace the time derivative with uh, minus i omega. So we have uh, dq dz. Now we're in a two-dimensional calculation grid because we're looking at you know each omega, each frequency at a time, uh, is equal to v over minus two times i omega. Um, times uh, d squared q dx squared. So q now, of course, is uh, is complex, and and uh, you can see we're multiplying by a complex number here. You know, one over i, um, and because uh, uh, we're in the frequency domain, but we're still in the x and z domain. So we finite differences, as as I've explained, with the Crank Nicholson averaging over z on the right hand side, right? So we're we're gonna add, we're gonna take uh, uh, d squared q dx squared at uh, both uh, z and z plus one. Okay, so we have three elements wide in x at z, and also three elements wide in x at z plus one. Uh, and the time derivative is calculated in the middle here, um, and so everything is centered at uh, x and uh, z plus half. Um, the uh, the alpha that's in here, uh, just to uh, to state it uh, uh, for the for less confusion, is v delta z over minus four times i times omega times delta x squared. And so let's look at the tridiagonal system, all right, and start thinking about what is happening at the boundary here. Okay, um, you know in in uh, uh, in the early parts of of lab. Eight, you uh, the earlier questions, the earlier exercises, you 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 start to get some facility with uh, making some changes to the you know how the system evolves and what the uh, you know what the waves look like, uh, and then there's uh, you know near the end of lab eight is this uh, horrible exercise to implement the uh, the side boundary conditions, okay, and so. Um, uh, on the left side now, remember uh, um, uh, we got two sides to this, and I, I was I was only explaining the uh, you know everything here on the on the right side in the Clayton and Enquist way. Uh, on the left side, uh, what do you want? You want you want to have this uh, this quarter circle, and so instead of having c, you have negative c. You know c has to be negative. And then you then you got the left hand side, you know you want uh, uh, waves to follow that quarter circle uh, uh, wave equation and propagate out of the grid to the left. So here is the uh, uh, the unknowns. Uh, here's the the whole tridiagonal system set up, right? We have um, q at z plus one and, and x minus one. Uh, and q at z plus one and x, and q at z plus one and x plus one. Okay, there's the coefficients. Those go coefficients go into the tridiagonal matrix. Here's that adjustable, you know, left side of the uh, uh, left end of the uh, of the center diagonal, the main diagonal. And then here's the knowns, right? This is q at z, and you know all the z's or z levels are known. Um, I mean, this z level is known. The next one is not. Um, q at z and x minus one. Q at z and x. Q at uh, uh, z and x plus one. And and this becomes just you know a d um, <clears throat> a d value. It's a it's just a complex number. You know after adding all this up, um, and it's at that uh, that z level. Uh, and it, well, it's also at one uh, value of uh, of x. So. You have uh, your knowns, uh, your vector, uh, right of of knowns, and um, you know this top one, d one, that's at x equals one. D two is at x equals two, okay. And um, likewise, the unknowns at the top, that's x at x equals one. Q two at uh, z plus one, that's uh, that's the unknown at, at x equals two, 
right? And uh, there's these various rows of the uh, tridiagonal matrix. Okay, looking at the left edge, okay, we have this implicit Q zero, right, at x equals zero, which is out beyond the left side, and that's at uh, uh, that's the unknown at z plus one. Here's the known d from the you know from that's out, hanging out on the left side, so that's the known d zero. We can manip manipulate that too, right? And here's the implicit uh, uh, zero multiplied by Q zero. And then here's the L that we can uh, manipulate. Okay, so looking at x equals two, right? You know, looking at these values here, everything's everything's there. We've got uh, uh, minus alpha times Q at z plus one, and, and x equals one plus uh, one plus two alpha times Q at z plus one, and x equals two um, minus alpha times Q at z plus one, and uh, uh, x equals three. That's equal to d2, and then here's d2. Okay, uh, just to detail that out. So this is exactly, you know, it's exactly this equation up here. All right, but what happens at x equals one? Okay, here's all we have at x equals one. You know, we dot product this with the the, the first row. Okay, we get the first d0 or the d1. Okay. Uh, so we have this adjustable L value times Q1, right? Not Q0 is not there at all, right? Um, uh, at z plus one minus alpha times Q2 at z plus one. Uh, this is x equals one, x equals two, and that's equal to d1, right? And in calculating d1, we want to use that Q0 at the previous z, right? Uh, minus alpha times that. And then the other parts, just like they were before. So our our triangle matrix solvers, uh, you know, which are also in Java, uh, you know, both the complex and the real ones, allow us to put in a different end. Okay. So on the left hand side, we'll call it capital L. If this was the equation for the right hand side, uh, you know, then it would be capital R. And uh, so uh, to find out what that should be. You know, for our Clayton and Enquist boundary uh, equation, um, we got to look more into what Q zero has to be. Okay, Q zero is on the boundary. Okay, now let's uh, let's suppose that we can always find Q zero. You know, it's like beyond the boundary from Q one, which is next door. Okay, and just by multiplying by some real or complex factor. Call that fa on the left-hand side boundary. Let's call that factor uh, b sub l. Okay, and it doesn't matter what z level the q is at; it's going to be the same b sub l. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you know, at the z level, q zero is equal to b sub l times q one, right? Wh whatever that factor is, you know, we got to find out what it is. But but that's what we that's what we're saying here. We can determine that unknown q zero. Which is like beyond the boundary uh, from Q1 using B sub L, and the same thing applies at uh, at uh, the z plus one level the, uh, in our unknowns. You know, for our unknowns, Q0 is equal, still equal to the same B sub L times Q1, and and we can find that factor B sub L at any z. Okay, so that's an assumption. This is this is how Clayton and Enquist uh, uh, you know were able to proceed on this. Okay, on the right-hand side, you know, if uh, x max is equal to k, right, we can find q at k at any z level uh, to be equal to. We can get it from some b sub r, right, which we can find. Um, time, and it's, it, this isn't an operator. This is a number, right? Uh, times uh, q at k minus one, you know, in the calculation area to the left. Okay. So then we can find Q zero, and we can also find Q. Um, uh, what did I call it here? Uh, well, nothing. Q uh, n plus one, right, is uh, down here at, uh, and there's also a d n plus one, you know, analogously. Okay, and so now our calculation looks like this uh, at at uh, x equals one uh, minus alpha b sub l, right? This is this is. This is uh, uh, Q zero, right? Q zero is B L minus Q one, 
Okay, and it's in the unknown level of the z's. Uh, and there's the uh, the ones we have. There's q1 and q2. Okay, there's d1 and uh, d1. You know, we wanted we wanted uh, q of uh, uh, we wanted q0, and q0 is uh, uh, b sub l times q1. Okay, and so rearranging this, we have um, uh, one plus two alpha minus uh, alpha times b sub l times q1, q at x equals 1, minus, uh, so this is now the coefficient, right? That's the coefficient uh, uh, in the, that we need to use in the tridiagonal matrix that gets multiplied by q1. And, uh, uh, and then here's uh, uh, q2 and, and d1 is still there. So now we know that we make the, the corner of the tridiagonal matrix, that, that capital L, we make that uh, one plus two alpha minus alpha times b sub l. Okay, so as long as we can figure out what b sub l and b sub r are, then we can implement this tridiagonal scheme. So one of the first things we do is uh, figure out: all right, what's if we have a zero boundary condition, right? What does b sub l and b sub r have to be? What would you what would you guess? You know, to get q zero. Uh, from Q1 under a zero boundary condition, okay, what is B sub L and B sub R? What do they have to be? How about zero? We're not talking about the operator now. We're talking about you know whatever Q1 is in the interior of the calculation. We want you know for a zero boundary we want uh, Q uh, Q zero to be zero. So B L B R they have to be zero. Okay. What about for the zero slope boundary? We want q zero to be equal to q one. Then it's one. Yeah. Okay. We'll figure that out. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So so already for for these simple but not very useful boundary conditions, we do have uh, b sub l and b sub r, right? So you could you, you know you can get started that way. All right. So it, the b sub l is going to depend on the boundary condition we use. Uh, and if we require a boundary condition operator, um, you know, be the boundary operator of the incident plus r times the reflected wave, you know, if we require that it has only first order derivatives in x, then we can get that single factor b l or and b r when we finite difference that uh, that first order equation. And I think I'd better do that. On um, a week from Monday, right? To finish up talking about um, absorbing boundary conditions, uh, so we're on page uh, uh, 132, 133 of notes number 27, and the 27A lecture that I, or video that I posted, is going to be uh, superseded by just a straight 27 video because there's there's only a couple more pages, um, and hopefully today we'll get a little bit into uh, 28. All right, so um, uh, we had expressed the boundary condition in terms of these boundary factors, okay, um, which can be real or complex numbers, and they can vary with depth and x and all that and time, but they uh, it's just one factor that says, you know, at this depth, at this x, at this time, you know, on the boundary, uh, on the left side boundary. You know, Q zero is B L times Q one, and so of course, if if you have a zero boundary, then then it, it, that means you want Q zero to be zero, then B L has to be zero. If you have a, a zero slope boundary, okay, uh, that means that Q O has to be Q zero has to be equal to Q one, and that means that B L of course is equal to one. And where it gets interesting, of course, is is that uh, for an absorbing boundary, you know, B L is going to be derived from a, a a little kind of fractured quarter wave approximation equation, which um, and so it'll be something that will be between zero and one, right? Um, and that will give us an absorbing boundary by on the left hand side only allowing the waves to propagate to the left, and so it won't reflect. And we saw that that can be effective, at least at, at, at certain set angles. Likewise, on the right-hand side, we use B sub R to tell us uh, what Q at k 
k on the right hand side, you know, x equals k is verse, uh, uh, in terms of the next one in, which is q and k minus 1. So the whole thing uh, boils down to setting bl and br, and they depend on which boundary condition we use. If we require a boundary condition operator uh, that has uh, you know, the boundary operator operating on the sum of the incident wave p sub i plus the reflection coefficient times the uh, reflected wave you know, p sub r, if th having all that equal to 0 after the operating. Okay, um, So that operator, if it only has first order derivatives in x, right, first order derivatives across the boundary, right? That means that we can get a single factor b sub l and b sub r when we finite difference that uh, uh, that that boundary condition operator that that fractured wave equation that we use on the boundary. Of course, if we you know if we had a second order derivative, we'd have to, we wouldn't have just one factor. We'd we'd have to use uh, you know a b l one and a b l two, right? We we could define the boundary element in terms of the next two in. Uh, so you could go further, but the way that Clayton and Enquist implemented this, they required that we only have first order derivatives in x. Okay, so we need an approximation to our quarter circle dispersion relation that is first order in kx. Now, you know, unlike uh, I've been talking about bl on the left side, and that's the quarter circle that's dashed here, but I'm I'm talking about br here on the right side. You know, in my when I draw the dispersion relation, so here we have you know, negative kz. kz is negative, so it's for upgoing waves for uh, downward continuation and migration under the exploiting reflector model. And we approximate this, uh, this quarter circle, which would only allow waves to propagate up and to the right. We approximate it with um, this line, which is uh, vkz, I'm sorry, vkx over omega is equal to c. Okay. And that's going to cancel very well, uh, where the intersection, you know, we set C to give us an intersection that uh, finds, uh, you know, that's where that's where this uh, this line meets the quarter circle, all right. And so that's where we'll have the best cancellation of uh, of the side boundary reflection, and it's at that angle theta one, which you can see what that what that would be in terms of. Uh, you know, vkx over omega and c. Okay, so um, here's our, our boundary equation, right? We have uh, vkx over omega minus c is equal to zero. So that's our, our boundary operator. And it's a, it's a fine boundary operator because it equals zero. Um, and uh, we take it into the physical domain. Okay, so. Uh, we recognize uh, the, that kx is uh, representative of a single x derivative, um, and uh, uh, there's a um, uh, and and we did this uh, we did this before. There's a there's a, uh, a an oh yeah we we clear it right. We multiply all three terms by omega, so that gets rid of the omega in the uh, in the denominator, and so then we have c times omega, and we multiply zero times omega as well, and so that we have an omega, and we have a, uh, a kx, and we multiply all terms by i, and maybe a minus one, and that gives us uh, yeah probably by minus i, and uh, then we recognize um, you know uh, 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 k uh, i kx as a uh, x derivative, and that allows us to to take it into the physical domain, you know, using the Fourier dual of of kx as uh, x as the x derivative, and the um, I'm sorry, i kx, and then uh, we have uh, minus i omega, and that is uh, it's has a Fourier dual of dp dt. Okay, so and we of course multiplied all terms by the wave field p as well. Isn't that tricky? So. Um, uh, that's all uh, uh, in here, and uh, the the important thing for what we're doing is that this is first order in x. It's only got one x derivative. doesn't have doesn't have a second order derivative in x. Uh, so now we need to put it in back into the omega domain and put it in retarded time. 
Okay, and so we'll do the same substitutions we did on the, the regular wave equations we're using for the, uh, the downward continuation in the interior. And so we, what we end up with is dq dx minus i omega c over v times uh, uh, q, okay, uh, and that's equal to zero. So um, all we have to do is finite difference this, uh, centering at uh, x plus half, okay, and, um, and then we'll see that we get our b sub l or b sub r uh, just, as we, uh, just as we want. So um, uh, we'll use the simple uh, Euler finite difference, uh, uh, single uh, difference in x, right? So we have q, and, and notice I've got to say where I am in, in z, and this is all at one z level, OK? So whatever z level we're at, uh, you know, we don't, notice we don't have any z derivatives in here. If we had z derivatives, we'd have to keep track of that. But we only have an x derivative, and there's no derivative in time because we're in the frequency domain. So we have uh, on the left hand, well, for uh, dq dx, we have x at, uh, I'm sorry, q at uh, x plus 1 minus q at x divided by delta x, right? So that's the simple finite difference. And then here's the minus i omega c over uh, 2v. OK, uh, now why the 2? OK, so we want to center the, right, the, the second term as well. At, uh, at x plus half, so we've got to take the average between q at x plus 1 and q at x, and then divide by 2. Okay, so that's all that is. That's just centering all the terms, all the, all the derivatives at the same place. Okay? Uh, and then we'll collect together a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of uh, constants. Right? Uh, we'll collect together i, omega, delta x, the 2, the v, okay? That's all collected together into this s constant, and so what we have now is. Uh, it, but we leave. Notice we leaving. We're leaving c out where we can where we can look at it, uh, because c is our adjustable parameter, right? That determines the angle that we're going to have the best cancellation of, of the side boundary reflections. So we'll leave that out of that, and uh, uh, so we have uh, q at x plus one minus q at x is equal to s times c times uh, q at x plus 1 plus uh, uh, s times c times q at x. And so then we can uh, collect together all the same terms of, uh, of q. right? So we have 1 minus sc times q at x plus 1 is equal to 1 plus sc times q at x. And, and so now here's that magic outcome you know, that gets us bl or br, right? It's one number, right? Uh, C is a, let's see, S is a complex number, right? S is imaginary, right? Omega, delta x, 2, v, those are all real. So I times that is imaginary, right? And um, uh, C is real, OK? It's just you know between 0 and 1, right? Um, so uh, 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 this is the, uh, you know, with C imaginary, this is the the imaginary part down here, and the real part of these ones. Okay, so we got a complex number here. Uh, that's uh, that's going to be our BL or BR, right? So here, this would be a left-hand boundary condition because it's giving us Q at x from Q at x plus one just by multiplying by this complex number, which is one minus SC divided by one plus SC. Okay, pretty simple. Um, and and that's what we that's what we wanted. We wanted that one number, that one factor that would give us the left boundary from the next one on the inside, right? Now, if I um, if I wanted to, if I solve this for uh, q at x plus one instead, well, that would be the br, right? That would would give me the uh, uh, that would be the the number that I would get uh, q at x plus one. By that number times q at x. All right. So now we can identify, right? So here, uh, you know, bl is q zero is equal to bl times q one, right? We don't we don't use this in the interior. We only use it, you know, at zero or at nx, right? That's 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 the only place we use these factors. Otherwise, it's just you know, it's the same it's the same uh, uh, finite difference scheme that we had uh, before. 
you know, whether it's 15 degree or 45 degree, what have you. But uh, on the border, you know, we're we're using this bizarre quarter circle approximation to the dis to the dispersion uh, dispersion curve. Okay, and uh, so we have BL is equal to one minus SC over one plus SC, and BR is equal to one plus SC over one minus SC. And I'm going to give you a hint about um, uh, one of the uh, um, one of the one of the hardest problems in Lab Eight, the hint is that uh, when you get it correctly implemented and you actually have an absorbing boundary condition on um, on each side, what you'll notice is that uh, is that apparently BL is exactly the same as BR. Okay, now how is how is that? You know that that makes this you know BL should be one over BR, right? But it's not. And and uh, and why is that? Okay, um, the reason is is that uh, the the C that we've written down here, okay, this C is positive and it's for the right hand boundary. If we're trying to approximate the the uh, uh, the left side of the quarter circle, the left quarter circle, the one that's dashed here, what is is C going to be positive or negative? It's going to be negative, so uh, you make uh, you make C negative, and uh, and and calculate BR, and suddenly oh, BL is the same as BR because you have a different C. You got to use a different you know on the on the left hand boundary you want the waves to propagate to the left, not to the right. Okay, so uh, and you but you only put in one C right, so it's gonna it's gonna look exactly the same. BL and BR are going to be exactly the same. Okay, because you got to you know on between the boundaries you got to the left and right boundaries you got to flip the sign of C. Okay, now in their paper, um, <clears throat> um, Clayton and Enquist present some higher approximations that are still first order in the x derivative. You know they might involve they, they might involve z derivatives um, and they might involve more time derivatives, which is you know we can handle that. Um, and but uh, uh, you know, and say if we if you know call the uh, the one we did use B one, okay, so that's boundary operator B one, okay, and it really only matches at this one angle, right? So if we go to a line approximating the quarter circle, you know, a tilted line instead of instead of just the constant C, right? Um, that ought to that ought to match better over a much wider range of angles. Okay, so this B two operator in green ought to be ought to be better. Uh, and then if we go to a hyperbola, and here's an equation for a, uh, a hyperbola. Notice that it's there's nothing, there's no more than a first derivative in x. You know, right? There's a lot of terms, but no more than the first derivative of x. So we can always boil it down to a BL and a BR. Okay, and so that's uh, that's why the, the even the hyperbola can be effective and. You know, it can be made to match the um, the quarter circle pretty nicely. Okay, depending on you know, there's a uh, uh, there's an A and a C for the B two, and for the B three, there's an A B C. Right? There's more more tunable parameters that you have, but um, you know, uh, you could you could set it to, uh, to work quite well. Uh, fact is. Uh, uh, nobody uses these, and and uh, uh, it could be that there are uh, uh, stability problems on the uh, you know you got this transition between your regular say uh, forty five degree uh, operator on the inside of the grid and the and your you know weird quarter circle approximation on the side, and there could be stability problems on that. Um, but I I've never seen a, a good exploration or, or explanation of why uh, why nobody uses these. So maybe maybe there's a way to improve the uh, side boundaries, uh, you know, without going to to the lengths that uh, some of the um, um, <clears throat> uh, some of the modelers go to of you know having to pad their their modeling zones with uh, you know big big areas of very low Q, for instance. That's the uh, what's currently uh, uh, very popular. 
So uh, I think, especially for migration, uh, uh, this could still be developed uh, further, and and uh, it, you know maybe maybe it's only useful in a, in a few cases where you know you're uh, like moving up dip and uh, and so and and your data ends you know right where a bunch of uh, reflectors at different angles are going to be hitting the uh, are going to be hitting the side boundary uh, when you migrate them. Uh, so I, I think that's worth uh, worth exploring. Okay, and and you can calculate the reflection coefficients of all these using the same uh, the same scheme. You know, r is equal to the minus the boundary operator uh, for kx and omega, and over the uh, boundary operator for minus kx and omega. And so, uh, you know, like for B three, you know, you can calculate that uh, you'll have much smaller reflection coefficients in general than you will for B one. Uh, and you'll be closer to zero in, in many more places. All right, so that's uh, that's the end of uh, twenty seven.